Nigerian textiles is really seem to make a big, big comeback, a big revival. It seems to be celebrated amongst many, many young Africans today, especially young Nigerians. Now we want to discuss some of this on today's video with an amazing, amazing guest today. So let's just jump in, but do remember before you watch the video, please, my friends, subscribe to the channel and make sure that then you will receive the update videos every single week. I put something new up on YouTube every single week. I'm Jacqueline Shaw, I'm your host today and I'm your African fashion business coach. So make sure to subscribe to the channel and let's just dive in and have a speak with our amazing, amazing guest today. Okay, Tunde. <laughs> How are you doing? How are you doing today? I'm good, how are you? I'm very, very well. It is my pleasure, 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 pleasure to have you here. And you. like I was saying to you earlier, we will be going back and forth with different messages along mm -hmm. different kinds of social media. But it's a, such a pleasure to have you because I really do respect the work that you do. And I really wanted to have you on to talk about it because this channel, Fashion Africa Voices, through Africa Fashion Guide on YouTube, is here to really talk about fashion in Africa that's done and spoken about it from the voices of those who are there on the continent. So okay. you are, you know, you're a change maker, you're pioneering. Um, I tried to bring a little bit of Africa here today, but I think it's not going to stand close to what you do. <laughs> so but I wanted to really speak about it today, um, about your brand. So do please introduce your amazing company, the products that you do. Tell us a little bit about it and the textiles, of course. That's what we're here to talk a lot about as well. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Tunde. I am... Um, I, I call myself an artist. Uh, I'm the founder of Ethnic by Tunde Olabi. Um, it's a lifestyle brand, um, Afrocentric lifestyle brand. Um, we design Ashoke, weave the Ashoke, and we make them into beautiful fashion accessories. Um, you know, like bags and shoes. Um, like I said, we've, we've delved a bit more into lifestyle because now we started designing other things like furniture, um, home appliances, and I mean home um, home furnishing and, and stuff like that. Right. So um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Um. <laughs> well, let's tap, let's tap into the artist side just a little bit because um, I come from the background myself as somebody who also calls herself an artist. I just chose the route for fashion, but I used to, I, I was an actual painting artist. That's where I started from. And I tried a bit of photography and that was a textile thing, but I directed myself down the fashion route. But you, you are an artist artist as well. And I've been seeing a lot, the growth of this industry in Africa. I mean, Africa has been doing art at <laughs> the beginning of time, but there's been a big interest and lots, lots of new fear, fears trade shows, fairs, events happening around African art. Here in the UK, you, New York, and in African countries, thinking Dakar and Lagos and, and various countries now. Um, tell us a bit about that, what, you, what you're seeing and your part in that big movement right now. Okay. Um, I mean, it's interesting to, to see how um, there, there is this sudden... sudden um, rush for African art, you know, this sudden quest for African art, everything Africa. Um, it's not just about people wanting it, it's also about Africans and black people trying to go back to their roots, trying to trace where they're from. And it's, it's so pleasing to see that because um, it, it, it shows that people now appreciate where they're from, you know, they're trying to learn about their history, um, tracing their roots back to where they're from. Um, who their forefathers were, you know, like Malcolm X said, um, we're not necessarily Americans, we're Africans that were brought to America, you know. So, you know, people are beginning to realize that Africa isn't a country, it's a continent, you know, where we're like a people. And just like the Europeans and the Americans, we also have a history, a very rich history that people have, um, as much as they've tampered with, They've also taken a lot from, from us. And um, now people are trying to take back those culture, take back those tradition, and also interpret them in different ways. Like what I'm trying to do with my textile design. Um, I'm not a fashion designer, but I, I just felt like Ashoke 
which is from my culture, the Yoruba culture, is something that um, should be celebrated beyond what we wear as ceremonial attires. Um, what I found out, the gap that I found out is that young people don't really like to wear ashoke because they feel like, oh, it's, it's traditional, it's heavy, it's this and that. But um, if you look at it in the real sense of it, take an ashoke and take denim side by side and look at the texture of the two of them. You know, if we can wear jeans, then we can wear ashoke. So when, when I thought about that, I thought, okay, why don't we find a, a cool way for young people to actually wear this fabric and wear them um, proudly, as opposed to them seeing it as some local fabric where they just wear to weddings and all that. So right now, the, the quest for anything Africa is, is unprecedented because this is where civilization actually started from. You know, if you look at some of the, the sculpture, like look at the Bini mask that is in the British Museum today. I mean, think about how long ago that was made. Look at how our art has influenced people like Picasso. Look at how our fashion influenced people like Yves Saint Laurent. You know, so... And Dior recently, he did a big collection with, yeah, well, more the wax print, but some um, indigo as well. Yeah, you know, so... I mean, you, you, you look at African art and you see how long we've come in terms of the sophistication that goes into African art. But it's, it's so, it's, it's um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, it's, it's crazy that they still refer to it as African art. You know, it's, it can stand side by side with any other art that you're talking about. Because the level of sophistication that goes into it. I mean, look at also the knock art. Look at the Yoruba art. Look at the, the sculpture that the, the people of Ife were making ages ago. If you go into the British Museum, you'll find a lot of them there. And look at how, look at the precision of the, the, the sculpture. Look at the precision of the details. And look at what Damien Hurst has done with copying one of what we've done and not giving credit back to where he actually got inspiration from. Mm. So, you know, there, right, there, there's, right. so much, there's so much about African arts that people, people are not acknowledging. You know, the yeah. West need, we need to acknowledge that African art has actually influenced a lot of what Europeans are doing now. I think African culture, African heritage, African, culture, African, yeah. African music, exactly. <laughs> Africa has influenced. Exactly. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, I mean, this, this is what it is, isn't it, right now? It's kind of, it's, it's annoying, but I think what I love about it is the fact that Africans on the continent and in the diaspora are stepping up and showcasing. And the fact is, calling African art is remembering that this is where this is coming from, giving kudos back to his heritage. And I think, um, even with what you're doing now, you're using the cloth in a new way. Well, it's not yeah. even a new way, but in a way that it's not usually used, I guess. And yeah. that's kind of bringing information to people who don't know about this textile. They might be like, oh, it's just, just they, they, they have no idea. So you're then giving it an opportunity to be seen in new ways. Would you say that's how you've applied your African textile art um, and interest in art to your business at Ethnic? Sure. Well, yes. Um, I mean, for me, I needed to look for a different way to interpret what, what my culture is. I needed to find a different way to tell the story of my culture to other people. Um, I'm, I'm a proud Yoruba, uh, Yoruba man. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that has come out of the Yoruba culture. The art, the, the textile, you know. The culture is vibrant. The culture is beautiful. And if you don't tell your story, people are going to tell your story in a different way, which may not necessarily be the truth. So the best thing is for you to tell your story the way it's supposed to be told to the world. I mean, you, you need to show it to the world to see that this is who we are, this is what we can do. And um, I think, um, you know, even before now, before I started working with Ashoke, people have always known Ashoke to be regal. People have always known Ashoke to be, you know, some sort of luxurious fabric. I mean, take, take for example, um, the former president of Nigeria, um, Obasanjo, when he went to visit Jimmy Carter, yeah, was it Jimmy? Yeah, it was Jimmy Carter. And he was in full 
Agbada Regalia, you know, oh. and Jimmy Carter was wearing his suit. But if you look at the two of them, who do you think is more royal? Who do you think is more royal? We don't even have to discuss. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> we're, very, we're very royal people. Yeah, you know, it does. You know, it makes sense. Um, they just saying, I can't remember the Yoruba saying about um, like your presence will go before you. Like your. Exactly. Yeah, it, it speaks exactly. for you. It and speaks I'm for you. Like, especially in Nigerian, very, very strong in regards to that. If I can put nearly 200 million people in one kind of thing, you know. <laughs> It will go before you. Yeah. It really, really does. It does present you. So, you know, now with your company, you've got all this history, this heritage, this love for your Yoruba, um, you know, your Yoruba heritage and the textiles. How did you actually, you decided you wanted to use a um, Ashok kit. Why did you, um, how did you set up Epic? What was the steps that you took to set up this? Uh, could you use leather as well with it for the bag and then you do in shoes? Tell us a little bit about that for those who don't know, especially about the production side in, in Nigeria, which is also seeming to come up quite a lot these days. Okay, thanks. Um, to be honest, like I said, I never thought about going into fashion. Mm. I, I, did, I studied graphic design and photography. So for me, fashion, I used to see fashion from creating image, you know, from an image point of view, from a photography point of view. I love fashion photography. You know. yeah. But... Um, um, I was working in advertising between 2010 and 2013, 2012 and 2013. Okay. Um, but um, while I was working in advertising, I, I wasn't getting the fulfillment that I wanted. You know, I, I knew I wanted to create products, but I wasn't sure what it was going to be. I wasn't sure what kind of product it was going to be. But while working in advertising, I was tired of... Um, um, the routine job, you know, I wanted a bit more flexibility where I can wake up and be an artist. I can wake up and be a product designer. I could wake up and decide, you know what, I, I want to learn how to play the guitar. But um, having a nine to five job wasn't going to give me that opportunity. So at some point I decided, you know what, if I really want to follow my passion and create products and do what I want to do, I need to get off this comfort zone of earning a salary and go out there and be an artist and create, you know. So I left my job, um, but before I left, I had been doing a research on, I wanted to have an art exhibition, uh, but I didn't know, I, I didn't um, decide on what topic it was going to be on. Okay. But one of the things I was looking at then was um, how African women tie their hair, you know, look at what you have, the way you've tied your scarf, you know, the different ways by to which people tie their hair. The Yoruba people tie the gele, and it's so flamboyant. It's big and level now. <laughs> exactly, you know. Okay, so you know, Ashoke, Ashoke kept on coming up, and I started thinking to myself, there must be something important and very um, historical about this fabric. And then I decided that you know, I'm going to do my research on Ashoke and probably talk about Ashoke rather than talking about just. Um, Ed ties and Ed gears and turbans and so I started researching on Ashoke and um, I traveled to the interlands where people weave actually weave fabrics. Um, I went to interview them, spoke about it, learned about how fabrics are woven, the different types of fabrics. Yeah. And then I had the exhibition in 2014. So after the exhibition, I started thinking to myself, okay, what next? You know. I've had this exhibition. People have seen what Ashoke is about. What else can we do with Ashoke? I started thinking sustainability. How can we sustain the weavers? How can we make sure that constantly they're getting jobs? Because if people are not like, take for instance now, we have this pandemic. Nobody's getting married because you're not allowed to have any gathering. Yeah. So my weavers, at some point, if I'm not giving them fabrics to weave for our product, they're not doing anything. Exactly. So imagine if this goes on. That means they're not going to be weaving fabrics for, um, for, for attires, for weddings and important ceremonies. So how else are they supposed to earn a living? So those were the ideas that came to mind that made me decide, uh, okay, you know what? Um, I have this pair of sneakers. It's made from fabric. That means I can make my own sneakers 
and tell my own stories using Ashoke, you know, telling my stories using Ashoke. And that's where it all started from. So from one sneaker to 100 to 200, and we're here, you know. So we went from sneakers to bags to, to furniture, you know, so many things that we've done. So that's how it all started, basically. That's just amazing. I mean, it just shows the, the opportunities um, yeah. in, um, well, in Nigeria, in fashion, utilizing this, this textile as well. But it just, you know, if you've got a creative mind, you can do so much more than what you just see. And I love this. Exactly. Um, but what were some of the challenges? I'm sure setting up a business, especially because you weren't really focusing on fashion in the beginning. What are the challenges that you found now going to actually physically start this business when I mean, you don't have the fashion background because many people think i don't have the background i can't do it so what were some of the challenges that you found um one of the first um major challenge was finding the right people to work with mm. um also uh one of one of the one of the other challenges that i had was people telling me it's not possible you know okay yeah, Is people it saying to, me, to do the business or because of the the mix. It's impossible to actually make those products here. So I went to a friend and said, "I I want to produce sneakers," and he said, "Are you crazy? Do you know what you need? You need like, like big machines and things like that, you know." Well, like, you to make machines. Yeah, I'm but obviously. Yeah, but I I need machines, but you have to look inwards. You have yeah. to find other ways of making things um i don't necessarily need to have the kind of factory that a nike or the chinese factories who make for the likes of nike and the rest i don't necessarily need to have that kind of factory there are souls that are pre-made so i don't necessarily have to produce my own souls yeah i could buy those souls exactly. and i can create my own upper part of the shoes which is the most important part i'm already creating my fabric so if I'm creating my fabric, I just need to look for the other components, like the, the, the mesh fabric, which is going to be the lining for the, for the sneakers so that it's breathable, the sole, the insoles. Some of these things, they're already pre-produced, so I can always buy them from the manufacturers, bring them to my own factory, and start putting things together. Buy my own machines. I have my machines for sewing. You know, I have my machines for skiving leather. I have my machine for whipping. You know, so... You look for things that you need to, you need in your factory, in your small factory, for you to be able to produce. If you then want to go large, then you can start thinking of, okay, how do I process rubber? How then do I start designing my own soles? But I mean, the world has gone beyond where you have to do everything by yourself. There are factories who produce soles. Give them your design, they'll produce your soles. They send them back to you, and you can do whatever you want to do with them. So I started looking at different ways by which, I mean, YouTube was a very good resource then. Yeah. I started watching videos of how um, factories were producing sneakers and how individuals also produced. So if individuals can produce, then that means I can produce. So I started looking at the different um, ways by which people were making things. Um, I took the ones that I can took from the factories, or some of the machines that I thought, okay, you know what, I think I need to buy this machine. And over time, as the business was growing, we were buying different machines at different points. You know, there were hand machines that we needed to buy. There are actual industrial machines that we needed to buy. And the time we were able to get out, I mean, we're still buying, we're still expanding. But right now we are at a point where we can comfortably produce um, sneakers to the highest quality. So <laughs> it's, it's all about looking inwards and finding solutions to whatever problems you have. So yeah, there was there was the manufacturing problem. We scaled the huddle. Yeah. And also the people problem. We found a way. You know, there's always going to be people problem. Yes, you know? always. That's what um, you get in business. You get people problems. <laughs> exactly. Access to funds. Um, well, yeah. Um, learning resources. You know, staying all night to learn how things are done. Uh, yeah. Considering the fact that I didn't study fashion, um, so I had to start designing shoes. I mean. As an artist, you can, if you can conceive the idea, then you can, you can produce it. That's something that this has really taught me because once you can, once you can dream dreams, then you can see visions. 
-hmm. But if you can't dream dreams, then you can't see visions. If you can't dream, then you can't see the possibility of things being done. But if you can think about it, if, if, you, can, if you can conceive it in, in your mind that, oh, you know what, I can produce, I can, I can make this phone whereby I can talk to someone miles away from me, from just this device. Then you start looking for the solution to what are the components, what are the things that you need to put together. Yeah. So that was what I did. You know, I started learning from other people things that I've never seen before. I've, I've never made a shoe. I started making, you know, I started designing, I started dissecting shoes okay. and seeing the different parts of it. I started looking at bags. What you, know. you were doing was product design and, you know, you know, it's not something that fashion designers think, I can just make a bag and just make a shoe. It's completely different product design. Yeah. Understand it. And people train, like, a lot of product designers have been trained in, or more even from car design, <laughs> and then then how to do, do things like shoes and bags is very very unique. So to learn that and to produce product, I mean, yeah, I think you've done excellently. So you know, I salute you. So what's some of the good things apart from the fact that I think you've done excellent excellently? What's some of the positives that you found when it comes to to working within Nigeria in this industry? What kind of uh, good points and encouraging others to think about doing themselves? What would you say to them? Um, I think one of the things I've, I've noticed about here is the, the zeal people have. The, you know, Ni Nigeria, Africa in general has come a long way. And um, in the last how many years, people have gone from making, you know, there was a time where people would say, I could never buy anything made in Nigeria. Now people have gone from, I could never buy anything in Nigeria, or I could, I could never wear anything made in Nigeria, to actually having a full wardrobe of made in Nigeria or made in Africa fashion, fashion products, you know, from clothing to accessories to food, you know, to service, you know, we've even gone into, into, into tech. Mm -hmm. So right now it's, it's all about giving people the opportunity to flourish. And then you would see how, how well they do. You know, we were hit with a lot of, um, we were hit with the recession. Uh, people started looking inwards. And I think this, we don't necessarily need to be hit by recession for people to understand that there's so much that can be done on the continent. There's so much power in the hands of Nigerians. I mean, Africans are brilliant people. Nigerians are amazing people. They're brilliant people. People wake up in the morning and they come up with the most amazing product. And you're wondering, what if this person is given more opportunity? What if this person is given the right kind of finance? What if this person is given the right kind of backing in terms of availability of um, raw materials? Um, or we had factories that people can go into and take in my design and say, oh, look, I have this, this design idea. Can you manufacture this spare part or whatever for me to complete this design? You'll be shocked at what people can do. So right now, we are at the point where I think industrialization is probably going to happen from Africa. It's not going to happen from Europe or it's not going to happen from America because what the average African is producing is amazing. Considering the lack of um, adequate infrastructure for us to... I mean, right now, I'm running on, on a power generator. There is no power constantly but we're still making amazing products. And I have a whole lot of other people who go through all these other challenges and still come up with amazing products. So <laughs> the, sky is, the sky has got a, view, it's got a beautiful view for, for Africa. <laughs> I agree. Absolutely agree. I'm seeing so much movement come to the market now. People are not being limited. They're not putting limits on or ceilings on. They're just breaking ceilings and disrupting the industry. They're breaking ceilings. So this is yeah. what for me makes it really interesting. So now talking from continuing on from you, your business, you've got products, you've concept products, you've things you're going against, you know, the fact that you haven't had the, the training in this, you're learning what you need to learn. Another part of that is you've got the product, how do I get it to market? So what's some of the sales channels or ways that you've got your product to market? Um, maybe can you share a, bit, a little bit about that? Um, right now, how do we go into market? Most, we, we depend mostly on social media. We depend mostly on technology uh, because we are, we're basically online. 
-hmm. we don't we don't have a brick and mortar, uh, and mortar store right now um, also we don't have um, we don't have stockists I think the only stockist we have is in Cape Town merchants and long um, those are the only people stocking our products for for now um, we've had relationship with um, some other stockists in Nigeria but things haven't really gone well uh, you know their business model doesn't really tie with what we are trying to achieve uh, so we, we decided to, to back out but we're still we're still looking to get other buyers other stores who are ready to you know stop what we're doing because we believe we have amazing products yeah. and it would be anybody's loss not to want to associate with with our brand you know if, if we do say so ourselves you know but um yeah um so right now we're just um relying solely on on our website and on social media to, to push our products okay so and word of mouth you know word of mouth yeah yeah when people buy they tell other people and that's really good. I mean, the fact that we've got social media these days means that there's opportunity to reach more people. It's a lifesaver. Uh, even without PR or these big spends and to, to go on those kind of marketing and old school advertising, you can do a lot yourself now, which is, which is great. Um, and then another thing is with, the, with, with your products, because of what the nature of what they are, the leather industry, I know that Nigeria has a, has a strong industry there. Um, well, quite a few African countries do. A lot of leather is exported from Africa as well in its raw form. How have you, what's your experience been sourcing leather locally um, in Nigeria and working there? What's your experience? It's been a problem. Okay. Leather has been a problem. Um, and that's because a lot of the tanneries here, I mean, Nigeria is said to have one of the best leather mm -hmm. um, because the, the goats here, the, the hide they get from the goat here is really saying that the tanneries, most of the tanneries here are owned by Nigerians, Nigeria owned tanneries. And the uh, owners would rather sell to people like Louis Vuitton and the Goodies because they are more, you know, they, they, they end more exporting the leather as opposed to selling to Nigerian owned businesses. You know, what I can afford to buy is not what Louis Vuitton is going to buy. Yeah. So for them, it's more profitable selling to the big brands. But so now we are having to depend on people who then import the leathers because what happens here is the tanneries here, they turn the leathers to a certain level and then they export them. They go do the finishing in probably Italy or wherever. They take to the big brands. Whatever is left from what the big brands take, they now export them back here. That's what we then buy. For it as well. So this is a major, major issue um, and part of my own research in African fashion from um, when I first studied this market. It's the value chain and um, exporting things in its raw form or not even just its raw form and then selling it back into the place that you've got it from or a neighboring country. And it's, yeah, it must be frustrating, it must be frustrating, but you are, you're trying to work with your local industry in this in this area though that's something you're trying to do it is frustrating because at one point i started looking at um buying leather from from kenya they have good tanneries there as well they have good leather as well there, yeah. yeah um but again when you think about how you know go to kenya and how much can you buy importing them back to nigeria what you would pay for duty and all that kind of problem you know it's a bit frustrating but the good thing about that is i could go into the tannery there give them my design mm -hmm. and they can make my design you know unlike the tanneries here they expect you to buy a certain quantity that you may not be able to afford but there they're happy to sell little quantities to you as yeah. long as it's, it's not, uh, yeah, as long as it's within the range that they're happy to produce for you. So that's another option that I'm looking at. I mean, I've explored it. I bought some from there. They're really good leather. So I'm, I'm hoping I can go back and, you know, get them to make more for me. Absolutely. It sounds like a good plan, actually. So this seems to be like lots of learnings and lots of lessons along your journey. You're still going, you're trying to keep work in this yeah. present climate that we're in at the time of this video recording. 
you're trying to keep your um your artisan um uh partners in work as well um which is a big sort of big need so what would you say are generally some of the lessons you learned and you know what you could say as tips to give to, and advice to give to other newbies who are just coming in to the market of african fashion Sorry, I didn't get. I didn't get that. I lost you at some point. Oh, I'm sorry. I was saying, what would be some of? Because you've learned a lot. You've had a lot of lessons that you've learned from doing your business, and oh, probably give some tips and advice. What would you say to others who are coming into this industry? Uh, lessons. To well, the, the the best thing I can say to anybody is to keep doing whatever it is they're doing. You know, if if you, like I said, if you can't dream dreams, you can't see visions. Um, and if you can't see visions, then you can't you can't come up with ideas. You can't come up with a, a meaningful product. You can't you can't see your idea through from ideation to production. Yeah. Um, so you need to be able to um, stay steadfast on what you believe in, uh, and always look for innovative ways of making things happen because there are always there is always going to be a problem. There will always be challenges that would almost want to stop you from getting to where you're going to i mean it's it's like saying you have an appointment and there's traffic trying to stop you from getting to where you're going to so all those things are going to be there but you need to say to yourself you need to be convinced in what you're doing um and say to yourself that you need to make this happen otherwise you would have ideas that there's so many ideas that die before the next day so if if you if you don't stay steadfast to it you will never see ideas come to fruition, you know. So for anybody just starting out, the best thing I can say is if you have an idea, go for it. No matter the problems or the challenges that you face, just find a way to go for it. Fall down as many times, but get up and dust yourself. The best advice, and I, yeah, I totally agree. And I can speak from experience. That's the only way you have to keep going because the challenges are going to come. Anyone thinks that it's not going to happen for them, they're lying to themselves. <laughs> it's going to come. That's business, right? So what's next uh, for you? Anything? I mean, yeah, we've had a lot of changes and pivoting that we've had to have in our businesses during this, this present uh, climate. But what's, um, I mean, you mentioned about the furnishing products. Um, are you continuing to do that? Or there was these one-off pieces you're doing? Or what's next for you? What's next for the ethnic? Um, for us, we're continuing to, to innovate, you know, come up with new products, new ideas. Yeah. Um, also, we're looking to collaborate with a lot more people because, um, I mean, with collaboration, you, there's much more you can do. You know, you have, you have more variety. You're, you're open to more ideas. You're open to more um, innovative products. So definitely, we're looking to collaborate with more people on, on different products, um, hoping to learn more from them because when you open your, your mind, when you open yourself up to other people who have brilliant ideas, that way you're learning from them and then it, it, it opens your mind into more possibilities because then you're not thinking about certain things. But the moment you open up to other people and they, they open up to you as well, they start to tell you things and you start to see things differently from how you've always seen it. So that, that, that's definitely going to help. So yes, we're, we're looking... We're looking at collaborating with people um, in different industry um, and yet still continuing what we're doing, definitely. What about other uh, Nigerian or other African textiles? Or are you Asha, Asha, Asha Care for Life or do you see yourself? Not necessarily. So, I mean, like, how do we, how do we then combine Asha Care with... Uh, for me, I wouldn't do Dutch wax. I wouldn't do Ankara and all this because for me, yeah. they're not African fabrics. Yeah. The Dutch, you know, but as long as it's an African fabric made in Africa, I'm ready to explore them. So at some point, I will be exploring things like kente, you know, which is the same weaving process. Yeah. There's some other weaving. Uh, there's some. There's some other fabrics that, that are woven in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, hopefully, when the pandemic and all, all the insecurity is over, I can travel to other regions and see how things are made, the kind of fabrics they make, and see how we can incorporate them into what, what we do. You know, so yeah, definitely, we're, we're looking at other opportunities in terms of the other type of fabrics from different parts of Africa that are woven and genuinely African, not 
not things that are imported from China or from the West. Yes. I love it. I love that you're, you're a man of my own heart when it comes to African textiles and I'm made in Africa, true African textiles. So, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been amazing speaking to you. Um, yeah, for those who want to learn a bit more about Africa, do check out the ethnic uh, website. The links are below. Um, do reach out to, to, to Tunde on um, the social media. Um, I mean, you're the man. <laughs> you're the man to speak to. It's been really thank great. So I want to just say thank you once thank more you. for your time. And for those who are watching, remember, every Thursday, a new video drops um, on this YouTube channel. Hi. Interviews, trainings, insights, all about African fashion, African fashion business, so you can get started or you can just learn a bit more about the amazing continent and all these gorgeous textiles and all these amazing people, disruptors, innovators, big thinkers, new thinkers, old thinkers with new ways. <laughs> but it's an amazing place for you to come and learn a bit more. So do make sure to subscribe to the channel and get in touch if you'd like to speak to me, Jack, and show you African fashion business coach. But until then, I'll see you in the next video. Take care, Jacqueline.